divers welcome to our facebook live awesome thanks for tuning in everybody we are super excited because in the month of october we have themed it our technical month so our tech diving is going to be our topics for our facebook lives and our dives and some other things that we've got cooked up for you. So just go to www.forstashy.com and find our Tech Diving Month landing page and check out all the really good things that we have in store there. We also have um, some suggestions on gear over on that page as well. And uh, some past presentations that we've given uh, during this month. We've put those on the landing page as well so you can either rewatch them or watch them if you didn't see them. Um, all right. So guys, uh, we have a guest presenter tonight. Very special. All the way down in Mexico, we've got Natalie Gibbs. Say hi to Natalie, everybody. Everybody type hey, in everybody. the comments. Yay. Everybody type in those comments. Go ahead and say hello to Natalie. Tell her where you're listening in from. If you're here in Florida, if you're outside of the Florida uh, area, or if you are in a totally different country, maybe you're listening in and we want to know. Guys, if you are new to 4C, my name is Nicole. I'm your guest uh, host for tonight, or I'm not your host. Yeah, I'm your host. Yeah. Anyways, but uh, if you don't know, um, we do a lot of presentations, Facebook Live, so you always want to make sure that you register because at the end of tonight's presentation, we are going to raffle off a $50 gift card to 4C. Woo! Guys, the reason why I, yeah, the reason why we want you to register is so that we can get you in on that raffle. We got to get your name so that we can put it in our random name picker. And uh, hopefully you will be our next winner tonight. So you have until 645 to register. I'll put that in the comment section if you have not registered yet. And you can do that really quick. Guys, if you're enjoying tonight's presentation, go ahead in the comment section, write us any questions that you might be having, or give us our thumbs up, our smiley face, or the heart emoji. We just love knowing that you guys are with us during our Facebook Live presentation. So we've got some people writing in, Natalie. They're all saying hello. We've got people from the West Coast of Florida. We hope you guys are okay over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you are new to the area or you, um, you don't know, uh, about this, but we here in South Florida, Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> here in South Florida, we don't have any cave diving, but in Northern Florida, we do have some cave diving and we do have some of our 4C instructors, dive masters and staff members who love to go up there and do these types of dives. So if you are interested, come into one of our stores and we will get you connected with one of our staff members and they can tell you who to take classes with and who to dive with up in the Northern Florida area. And then Natalie's going to let you know who you can dive with um, in Mexico. So we'll let her give that in her presentation. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Natalie. Uh, Natalie, I'm going to share your PowerPoint, okay? And you have the floor. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me. It's um, so much fun for me to do these talks and reach out to people that I otherwise maybe wouldn't have an opportunity to meet. So um, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Natalie Gibb. I'm co-owner of a dive center named Under the Jungle, which is a cave diving center in Mexico near Tulum, which is a place I think probably most people have heard of already. Um, I'm a full-time cave diving instructor. I'm a cave explorer. I'm a member of the Women Divers Hall of Fame, and I am an underwater videographer and photographer. And so probably about all but two of the photos you're gonna see tonight are mine. Um, and so here we go. I wanna to talk to you today a little bit about cave diving where I am. So if I say cave diving, what's the first word that comes to your mind? People often associate really scary words with cave diving like darkness or claustrophobia or drowning or risks or getting stuck or danger or entrapment or just terror, all of these awful words. 
And when I was preparing this talk, I Googled cave diving and the algorithm helpfully suggested the following two topics as related searches, cave diving deaths and cave diving fatalities. Yeah, and accidents. So I'm sure that really helps my parents sleep at night. But if you erase all of these admittedly off-putting and preconceived notions and talk to actual cave divers, you notice they often describe caves entirely differently. Caves can be really bright with light effects streaming in from the cenote openings. And caves can also be really dark, especially those with black deposits on the walls. And of course, some caves are really small, but they can also be unbelievably vast. And if you talk to any of my former cave diving students who have become certified cave divers, most will describe cave diving as peaceful and sometimes exhilarating, but never scary or terrifying. In fact, if you hear a cave diver humble bragging about how he almost died cave diving to show you how hardcore he is, it is my opinion that he either pushed himself far beyond the limits of his training and in his, in his experience, or he's simply just not a very good cave diver. I'm a fairly accomplished cave explorer, and even when I'm exploring really extreme caves, I try to use good judgment and safe planning to avoid near-death experiences. And I do not believe that cave diving needs to be an adrenaline sport. I am a full-time cave diving instructor in the Riviera Maya, Mexico, which as I mentioned is near Tulum, and it is one of the world's cave diving hotspots. And although the area sees thousands of cave divers each year, we have relatively few cave diving fatalities, at least of cave, trained cave divers. And in each of these few cases, the divers broke established safety guidelines or dived well past their experience level. For divers who seek proper training and rigorously implement the rules and techniques of that training, I would go so far as to make the bold statement that cave diving is reasonably safe. I fell in love with the caves and cave diving 16 years ago because caves are one of the most fascinating, untouched, and mysterious dive environments on the planet. And I have since dedicated my life to all things cave, training future cave divers, exploring and surveying new caves, documenting Mexico's flooded caves with photos and videos, and working towards science and conservation. I could talk your ears off for hours and hours about cave diving, but I have a limited time. So now that I have hopefully piqued your curiosity, and maybe dispelled a few of the negative preconceptions about my favorite activity, I will try to touch a little bit on the various aspects of cave diving. I'm gonna briefly cover why I find Mexico's caves so fascinating. I'll go over some of the safety rules that all cave divers follow to stay safe. I'll talk about the process of becoming a cave diver and how you can find an instructor that fits you. And I'll briefly touch on some of my explorations and scientific activities. All right, so part number one, why do I cave dive? The caves in Mexico are uniquely beautiful and varied. And one aspect that makes them so breathtakingly lovely are the speleothems or cave formations that are present in our caves. Speleothems are as varied as the caves themselves. There are rooms filled with hundreds and hundreds of the most delicate formations that hang from the ceiling like icicles. And there's rooms with massive columns that take thousands of years to form. The way that these cave decorations grow is really interesting. And it tells us about the unique geological history of the caves in Mexico. These sort of formations can only form in air-filled passageways, like this one, 
When caves are not flooded, or when they at least have partial air spaces, rainwater from the surface dissolves limestone and moves through the porous sponge-like rock and drips from the ceiling. As carbon dioxide releases from the dripping water, the calcium carbonate from the limestone is deposited onto the ceiling and the formations, causing the formations to slowly grow. This means that any cave that has speleothems in it was once air-filled. And in regions like Florida, where the caves are also really, really cool, um, the caves were never dry, and so there are no speleothems at all. In Mexico, the caves were last dry during the most recent glacial period, which ended 10 to 12,000 years ago. As the sea level rose, the caves flooded, formation stopped growing, and in certain areas, the limestone began to dissolve again. So the minimum age of any formation you see in any of my photos is 10 to 12,000 years old. For me, cave diving in Mexico is like diving in a place that has been frozen in time and untouched. But most of these formations are likely to be much, much older, maybe formed over periods of glacial periods and cycles. Speleothems are estimated to grow at a maximum of about one centimeter every hundred years. And this is when they form quickly. So think of how old this blob here could be. <clears throat> the entire Yucatan Peninsula is limestone, and caves have been forming here through the process of dissolution for the last two million years. That's a long time, and has led to the formation of the longest interconnected flooded cave systems on the planet, at least that we know about right now. In my state of Quintana Roo alone, there are thousands of kilometers of surveyed cave passageways. The current longest cave is Sakaktun, which has over 369 kilometers of surveyed cave in complex branching tunnels. The system has at least 228 cenote entrances. Exploration in the system is collaborative and it's ongoing, with the first tunnels charted in the 1980s and the most recent updated survey, including new passages from this year. My exploration partner, Vince, and I even added a few kilometers to it several years ago. The vast majority of the caves here are shallow, with maximum depths less than 100 feet or about 30 meters, and average depths sometimes as shallow as 20 feet or 6 meters. So in Mexico, we regularly make several two-hour cave dives in a single day without ever getting into deco. Yet even with the ability to spend long days in the water, the sheer length of the flooded cave systems makes it impossible to know every tunnel. And for me, that's part of the allure of cave diving in Mexico, slowly adding to one's knowledge of what is practically a never-ending labyrinth. So I will never run out of dive sites, and I will always have a list of places that I want to go check on my next day off. And of course, as we mentioned, exploration in the area is ongoing. So to give you a concept of the scale, my exploration partner Vince and I have discovered and surveyed over 90 kilometers of previously unknown cave passageways. And we are not the only explorers in the region. There are numerous exploration teams who have all accomplished similar, if not greater amounts of exploration. And one of my proudest accomplishments as a cave explorer and a cave diving instructor is that many of my former cave diving students have gone on to become cave explorers themselves. The entrances to the caves, which are called cenotes in Mexico, are beautiful. Light streams down through the jungle to create otherworldly light effects. This image is from Cenote Ponderosa, a site that can be dived as a recreational diver on a guided cavern tour. And even the rock itself is interesting if you look closely. The limestone bedrock of the Yucatan Peninsula began forming 200 million years ago under the ocean. Marine sediments layered with coral skeletons 
and even marine organism exoskeletons to create a thick limestone platform. So while from a distance, these cave walls may look like plain limestone, they're actually studded with coral fossils of all sorts. A woman down here is the first person to study coral fossils in the caves, and she thinks we may be able to learn about past climates and ocean conditions by studying these well-preserved fossils. We can even find conch shells and sea urchin fossils, remains of creatures that lived in the unimaginably distant past. And marine fossils are not the only fossils that we find. The cool, dark, and static environment of the caves is perfect for preserving remains that would degrade and disappear in the hot and humid Yucatan jungle. So remains of creatures like mastodon, cave bears, and other creatures had never been found in the region until cave divers discovered them in flooded caves. These creatures either crawled back into the dry caves and perished inside, or their bodies were washed back into the caves when the caves were partially flooded. So the last two images is a giant turtle fossil, we think, and then another bone site in one of our explorations at Cenote Melbach that we just found maybe four or five months ago. And these are the remains of a giant ground sloth that Vincent and I discovered kilometers from the surface at one of our exploration sites. And the pelvis in the upper right-hand corner is actually larger than I am. I'm not very big, but it's still the pelvis is big. Um, a team of divers discovered a vast wealth of bones in a site called Oyo Negro, which has been featured in National Geographic. Human remains from a woman called Naya are thought to provide a missing link in our understanding of ancient people's movement throughout the Americas. And divers have even discovered pottery and archaeological items from Maya civilizations. This is a pot that my former student Ariel Ginsberg discovered with her dive buddy Ben Popic in Belize just recently. The caves in Mexico are connected to the ocean, which means that while fresh water flows out of the caves into the ocean, salt water can also flow into the caves with the tide. And if you go deep enough, you will eventually move out of the freshwater lens and into the salt water. And so that's what you're looking at the bottom of this image. It's this weird salt water pool. The interface of fresh and salt water is called the halocline. And it looks like you are floating above an underground lake or river. It's just the most unusual thing. And in certain places, a layer of hydrogen sulfide released from the breakdown of organic matter gets suspended just at the halocline level due to the density differences between fresh and salt water. The result is a spooky gray cloud that looks like a floor, but it isn't. And in some places, the hydrogen sulfide even forms wisps and waves. And no discussion of Mexico's caves would be complete without mentioning the strange endemic creatures that live in the darkness. This is a blind Mexican cave fish. And this is a remipede, which is like an underwater millipede. It lives in the salt water. And there are huge amounts of tiny shrimp and other crustaceans that live in the caves. One of my favorites are isopods, tiny little cave roly polies that behave just like they do on land. In caves that are really close to the ocean, you can even find sea life like these scallops and these weird sponges. And sometimes anemones, or this is a mangrove upside down jellyfish, I believe. And there are sometimes sea stars and even brittle stars. So the caves in Mexico are so much more than just wet rock. They are vast labyrinths filled with geology and history and biology, clues to the mysteries of our past. To this day, they are largely unexplored, and they are shockingly gorgeous. And there's as many reasons to cave dive as there are cave divers. All right, part number two. How do we stay safe? What are some of our cave diving rules? 
So clearly, there are plenty of fascinating things to see in flooded caves. But just as clearly, it's important to be safe while doing so. So cave divers have five safety rules that we hold sacred, and no self-respecting cave diver would ever violate one of these rules. These rules are known as the five rules of accident analysis, and they come from the examining why people used to die in caves back when cave diving was really, really dangerous, and then not doing that. <laughs> um, every cave diving fatality that I've ever heard of involves a violation of at least one of these rules. So the first rule is to seek proper training. The number one demographic of people who die in caves is certified open water scuba divers or above that do not have specific cave diver training. The old saying goes, you don't know what you don't know. And sadly, many divers, including open water instructors who feel comfortable and confident in their home environment and often are really great divers, discover that they are simply lacking the information to cave dive safely after they are already in the cave. So it makes sense. The completion of proper cave diver training is the best way to avoid issues while cave diving. The second rule of accident analysis is always maintain a continuous guideline to the open water. A guideline is a thin, usually nylon line, like the one the diver is installing in this image. Guidelines are placed in the cave tunnels, marking the route like a pathway. Cave divers always keep the guideline in their peripheral vision, and usually within arm's length so they can see how to get out and so that they avoid becoming disoriented. In the likely event that divers lose visibility, they can grab the guideline and follow it out of the cave by touch. And divers train for zero visibility exits like this in all levels of overhead training. So the guideline rule is one of the most important rules that we have to stay safe. Many caves in Mexico have permanent guidelines installed to make our lives easy. And when Vince and I are exploring new caves, we place our own permanent guideline in the cave and leave it there for future dives and future divers. Another equally important safety rule is known as the gas management rule of thirds. So simply put, cave divers can use a maximum of one third of their total breathing gas to go into the cave, one third to get out, and one third is held as a reserve. This means that even at the farthest point in the cave, divers have at least twice the amount of gas that they need to exit. This keeps them safe in the event of a delay and gives them plenty of gas to share air with a buddy if they need to. The next rule of accident analysis used to be known as the lights rule, which urged divers to carry redundant backup lights. The rule has since been expanded to include adequate redundancy of all vital life support equipment. And if you look at us cave divers in these images, you'll see we look like little balls of gear. We have a minimum of two tanks, two regulators, two backup lights, two masks, etc. Basically, we have backups of our backups of our backups. And this makes sense because cave diving is an equipment dependent sport. And it allows us to solve any gear problem that we may face in the cave calmly and still have the ability to exit on our own gear. On top of this, we also have buddies with us that have additional redundant gear. And we test each and every piece of equipment in the water immediately before the dive to make sure that it's all present and working. And of course, we don't dive with unsafe gear. Depth is the final common thread in accident analysis. It might be easy to say don't dive deep in caves, but while I would say that deep diving increases the risks, I think it can still be safe to dive deep. The key for me is the availability of sophisticated breathing gases such as Trimix, which allow divers to reduce narcosis and deeper decompression obligations on deeper dives. Add to this modern, sophisticated decompression protocols and training, and the widespread use of rebreathers. And I would say that with proper training and progressive experience, 
deep diving in caves can be done safely. So seek proper training, maintain a continuous guideline to the open water, follow the gas management rule of thirds, have redundant gear, and use the proper gases and equipment for deep cave diving, and that's it. A great deal of cave diving's risks are immediately eliminated by following these simple rules. All right, so how can you learn to experience Mexico's flooded caves or the flooded caves in Florida? There's many options and many training organizations and a great number of cave diving shops. So I can't go into all of the options, but I will discuss how we organize our cave training at Under the Jungle, which is my cave diving center, and a little bit about our instructional philosophies and how to evaluate a potential cave instructor or center. My dive center advocates progressive training, meaning that the path to becoming a cave diver is divided into distinct steps. And we suggest gaining experience at each certification level before moving forward. And you can probably already see that cave training is a commitment in time and energy. There's a huge amount to learn in order to become a proficient cave diver, and the training should not be rushed. The first step on my little flowchart is a guided cavern tour, and you'll notice that this is not training at all. A guided cavern tour is exactly what it sounds like. It's a guided tour of the cenotes in the cavern zone. To go on a cavern tour, you don't need any special certification or equipment. We happily take experienced open water divers in single tanks into the cavern in accordance with local protocols and TDI standards. Guided cavern diving is a great way to get a little experience in the cenote environment and to test it out and see if you like it. It's also a great way to get to know a dive shop and the dive shop's philosophies and the instructor's personalities before you commit a great deal of time, energy, and money to cave training. At my shop, cavern tours are treated very seriously. We teach divers a little bit about the cavern environment and a little bit about basic diving techniques for that environment. So potential students get a feeling for what cave diving is like. All of our tours are private with divers or buddy teams diving with their own private instructor. And all of our guides are actual cavern or cave diving instructors who are qualified to teach to dive in the environment. And this is well above local standards for guides and tours, which often combine groups of up to four people who don't know each other with a guide who is simply a certified cave diver as opposed to an instructor. Guided cavern tours are also an excellent way to enjoy the cenotes without ever having to do cave training if you don't want to. So you can just go in and do some guided cavern tours and get to see all of this and it's incredible. If you do decide that you want to be a cave diver, the next step is to learn to use doubles properly. Students can choose to do training in either back mount or side mount. And it's important to note that our shop is philosophically opposed to overhead training in single tanks. And will only train divers in doubles, even though many training organizations will allow cavern training in single tanks. During doubles training, students are introduced to all the cave level base skills that they need to succeed at subsequent levels of training, such as advanced buoyancy and trim control and advanced propulsion techniques, including the frog kick, flat turns, and the reverse kick. Interestingly, this is probably the most difficult course that we teach. Students additionally learn emergency management skills such as long hose air sharing and valve shutdowns, as well as a host of other skills and techniques to manage issues related to their equipment configuration. Even some of our caverns are so extremely fragile that it's essential that students learn these skills before ever entering the overhead. As well, from an instruction standpoint, it's nearly impossible to teach someone to run a line properly or navigate an exit in zero visibility if they're still struggling with buoyancy or the reverse kick. It's simply too much information 
and overloading students with too much to learn at once just sets them up for mediocre skills or failure, and we're not into either of those things. For divers who already have experience in doubles, it's possible to test out of this part of the course. However, due to the delicate and demanding environment and the shallow nature of the dives, which makes buoyancy way more difficult, and the complex nature of the skills, most students do need a few days of warm up before beginning the next step. For divers without doubles experience, this course usually takes a minimum of three days in back mount and an absolute minimum of four days in side mount. The next step in this rubric is cavern training. The cavern diver course qualifies divers to dive with a similarly certified buddy in what we call the cavern zone. The cavern zone can most easily be thought of as the entrance to the cave, where there are big open spaces and visible daylight. Divers cannot penetrate more than 200 linear feet or about 60 meters from the open water. But don't doubt it, this is still serious overhead diving. The learning for curve for this course is really steep. There's so much to learn in cavern diver training. This is the course where divers learn all of the overhead essentials, from line work to navigation to referencing and emergency skills and zero visibility procedures. This course introduces a huge amount of information, but we wouldn't have it any other way, and there's really nothing that we can leave out. So cavern training with our shop takes a minimum of five very intense days. The next step after cavern is intro to cave. The introductory cave diver course is a student's first step out of the reaches of natural daylight. Students are limited to penetration using one sixth of double tanks and still need to stay in large open spaces. The best thing about this course is that once qualified, students are able to independently cave dive within the limits of their training in a huge variety of caves in Mexico. During the intro to cave course, students put to use navigation skills and emergency skills that you, they learned in cavern, but they do it back in the cave, which is a significant step. And the course also introduces new skills, such as lost line, lost buddy, and line repair procedures. If properly taught, this course is actually easier than cavern because the students have already gone through the steep learning curve to become overhead divers. There's still a lot of new information, however, so this course takes a minimum of three days with my shop. This is actually a place you can visit as an intro to cave diver. And of course, the final step is full cave diver. Full cave is the course that teaches students to navigate through restrictions or tight places, to perform complex navigation and venture down secondary cave passageways, and to dive to a full one third of their tanks. With the depths typically dived in Mexico, full cave divers can easily get two hour dives on a single set of doubles. And there are literally thousands of caves to be dived at this level. Full cave with my shop, of course, still introduces a huge amount of new information, but students typically find it easier than the previous levels if they're properly prepared. And the course takes a minimum of five days. So this is a full cave diver exiting a restriction. After completing full cave, it's best to get some experience in before taking more courses. At that point, there's a host of specialty classes and workshops that students can take depending upon their interests. So hopefully, cave diving is starting to sound a little less crazy than it did at the start of the talk. I've gone through a detailed explanation of the different training levels to show you that there is a solid, organized system in place for cave training and that no reputable cave diving instructor will just slap you in doubles and take you into tight caves within a few days. Cave training is progressive, and it's done within the student's comfort and skill level. And with my shop, it takes about 14 non-consecutive days to complete properly. So if this still sounds like something you may want to do someday, the next step is to choose your instructor and shop. I'm not gonna tell you that you should definitely do training with my center because we might be a good fit for you or we might not. So these are simply some, some considerations that I think are important. The most important decision you can make is your choice of instructor and dive center. Their attitude, 
personality and interests should mesh well with yours, which is one of the reasons that I advocate guided cavern tours to meet potential instructors. The choice of instructor is so important that I would prioritize this over organization or location. You should also choose full-time cave instructors in my opinion. While recreational instruction can be done quite well by part-time or hobby dive instructors, technical diving is different, it's more complicated, and so I would go with somebody who teaches full-time and lives where they teach. And if there's something you particularly want to do with cave diving, ask if the instructor has helped anyone to achieve that goal. Prioritize instructors who encourage divers to dive independently at their certification level with similarly trained buddies. Ask if certification is guaranteed. Any instructor or center that promises to certify you or promises to certify you within a specific time frame does not have your best interests at heart. Flooded caves are one of the most dangerous places on the planet, and not everyone is cut out to be a cave diver or can complete the training in a specific amount of time. If, and consider value and not just cost. So if a person wants a cheap and fast cave course, they're certainly available, but it's important to consider the big picture and what you are looking to get out of this. All technical and cave training courses are not equal, even if they are offered through the same training agency. Ooh, all right, the last part, and then I'll stop talking about caves for a little bit and get some questions from you guys. So at this point, the photo quality is gonna go way down because a lot of these are GoPro screenshots from actual exploration events. So from a young age, I always wanted to be an explorer. For me, learning and experiencing new things is the whole point of being alive and cave diving is just one way to indulge these impulses. Half the reason that my business and exploration partner, Vincent Roquette Pathala, and I opened Under the Jungle was to create a base for exploration and science, not just for ourselves, but also for our divers. And so far, it seems to be working. As far as exploration goes, Vince and I have explored over 90 kilometers of cave and discovered around 20 new cave systems. Exploration requires a huge amount of time, money, and effort, but it's incredibly rewarding. And the first thing that people usually ask me is how do you find new cenotes to explore? Some people just walk out in the jungle looking for cenotes, but unless you have the landowner's permission, this is illegal and not to mention rude. So Vince and I have found it to be most efficient simply to talk to landowners and ask them to show us their cenotes. This is me and Vince with Jesus, who manages the cenote called Chicken Ranch for obvious reasons. And this is our team with the owner of our very first exploration project. The owner is Antonio Manrique and the, pro the project was called Tatich. So even when you find a person like one of these guys who owns a cenote and is actually interested in showing it to you, you usually still have a long hike in the jungle to reach the place. And you have no idea if it will have cave or not. These are involved days and sometimes the hikes are really long. We often hire porters if the walk is really, really long. And of course that costs money and energy too. And even then, once we get in the water, I would say that maybe one out of every 20 cenotes that we check has dive cave. This place had water and it was a really nice sinkhole, but it didn't have horizontal cave passageways. So we found our first going cave in 2010 from a cenote called Tatich. And we went on to explore caves all up and down the Riviera Maya. And some of them were really beautiful, like this one called Mukin. And then things started to get a little more interesting. We were invited to work in some towns in the center of the Yucatan Peninsula, where there are sinkholes reaching over 200 feet in depth. And I even dove into this daunting boil on the north coast with extreme flow conditions. 
but by far the strangest caves we have explored. The most dangerous and the most rewarding are the microbial caves that we've been finding near the southern border of our state. Oh no, guys, it looks like Natalie's internet cut off. Uh, give us one second for her to come back on. <laughs> I'm not sure what, is that, what happened. Uh, while we're waiting for Natalie, let me just show you guys. Um, if you are interested in any of our events for Tech Month, uh, go to www.forcefashion.com, go to the events tab, and here is all the events that we have going on, but then also go check, learn more, press that button, and here's that tech dive page that I was talking about. It has awesome videos, presentations that we've done in the past, um, learn about our tech courses and our tech charters that are available, and some of the really awesome uh, technical gear that we have at the dive centers. Um, so check out this page if you're interested in more to learn about tech diving. <laughs> oh no, Natalie, where'd you go? <laughs> um, so I do know that people are asking questions. We will get to those um, soon. Hopefully Natalie's computer didn't die from her battery not being charged. <laughs> and hopefully we get her back here soon. So we'll give her a few more minutes here. Um, but if you are interested in going, uh, diving in the Yucatan area, um, she, some, somebody was asking for a dive shop or guide, um, in those cenotes, uh, under the jungle, which is Natalie's company is the, um, company that we are suggesting people to go with. Uh, she's got lots of training under her belt. Um, and so does some of the other people that work for her or work with her, excuse me, and uh, under the jungle, you can just Google um, or I can send you that link. And basically we can uh, get you guys information about how to do the caves and caverns of the Yucatan. Um, she was actually telling me that uh, you, if you want, you can kind of make it a really cool dive trip where you uh, go and dive on the island of um, Cozumel, and then you can come over to the mainland and then they can help you schedule doing uh, dives with them. So if you wanna kinda do a mix of both ocean dives and some maybe cavern dives and learn some cave diving, you can do that. And if you're uh, during the winter, sorry, not winter, well actually yes, during the winter months, um, there are some charters in that area that do um, where you can dive with sailfish that's right. These bait balls with sailfish like all around you. Um, that's during the winter time. And then during the summers um, off of Isla Mujeres is the whale shark and uh, big manta ray season that's down there that all the animals to, to hang out in. So um, there's lots to do in that area. So um, definitely it's a really great um, dive trip that uh, I'm actually trying to get our dive travel manager to set up uh, a trip for the summer to do the um, whale sharks. And then hopefully we can do some cenotes. So um, sorry, guys, I don't know what happened to her. I'm not even getting her response on an email to say like she's coming back in. Uh, Sterling answered the question under the jungle has rooms you can rent. So in case you guys needed that information. Okay, hold on one second, guys. I'm just seeing if she's coming back in. Oh, boy. Natalie, what happened to you? <laughs> All right. Now you guys just saw my emails. <laughs> All right. So, well, since I have, um, I'm still waiting for Natalie to jump back in. Why don't I go ahead and do our, there we go. Uh, let's do our raffle. I know that um, I know that you guys registered and we usually just at the end of the presentation, but since we're trying to buy some time waiting for Natalie to get back on, um, let's go ahead and do our random name picker. There's all the names, guys. Let's go ahead and pick randomly. Da -da 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 -da. Fifty dollar gift card to four C goes to Robert. Uh, Robert Camerick. 
I'm sorry if I butchered your last name, but Robert, you are a winner. Um, we will be emailing you where you can pick up your gift card and you can use that at any of the 4C stores and get yourself some gear to go diving or maybe some gear to go um, cavern or cave diving. So Robert, you are a big winner tonight. So make sure you give us a woohoo on the, uh, on the Facebook live comments to let us know that you're excited to be the winner. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is so weird. What happened to Natalie? Usually she would have been back by now. I'm going to go with that. She probably didn't have her. Yay, Robert. Woohoo! Um, I'm guessing Natalie maybe didn't charge her computer or maybe there was something wrong with the hotspot that she was using. Um, you know, she is down in Mexico. So, oh, wait, here she comes. Natalie, are you there? <laughs> Hold on. She's trying to come in. It's like, um, I feel like when I say she's trying to come into the room, it's like I'm a medium and the spirit's coming into the room. But no, she's a real person. I promise. And if you guys are enjoying this presentation, thank you. Give us that thumbs up, that smiley face, and that heart emoji to let us know that you are enjoying. And uh, also, um, any comments that you guys have, um, go ahead and write them about, and we'll get those questions answered. Or if you have comments about um, what you're watching. Okay, let's see if this works for Natalie. Let's see. Where is she? Oh boy. Natalie, are you there? <laughs> oh, you guys are enjoying this, aren't you? The torture of the spirit person to the... I, I... Yay, you're back. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I've been able to see the entire thing. Okay, uh, you're good. So we can hear you. I'm going to bring back your presentation. So what's the last thing you heard? I don't know when I cut off. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I was uh, loading the raffle. And uh, <laughs> so I wasn't sure. Anybody want to help? Um, I think you were, were you on this? Uh, go, go back a few. Um, okay, let me just scroll. Oh, hold on. It'll take me just a second. That's okay. Um, I was talking about our exploration at Pandora. Yes. Go ahead and start there. All right. Thank you. Hold on for just a second. All right. So you can hear me now. Can you tell me if you can see this still? Oh, no. I don't know. <laughs> she she got kicked off again. Okay. Hold on, guys. Oh, you were talking about picking the right instructor. Thanks, Erin. <laughs> okay. Natalie, come back. <laughs> you gotta love the Wi-Fi in Mexico. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Natalie, you were talking don't about Yep, you were talking about picking the right instructor. That's where it um, dropped off. Oh, wait, well, it cut off like five minutes ago. Okay, cool. So I'll just pick up with the exploration portion of the talk then, if that sounds good to you. Perfect. Okay, can you still hear me okay? Yes, but I don't have your PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it up. Okay. It's interesting because I have no way to know when um, I lose the... Yes. When I lose the thing. <laughs> That's All right. okay. All right, you are you're good to go. All right. Oops, let me just scroll back a little bit. All right. So the final part of my talk is about science of exploration. And I'll just probably check in in here with Nicole and make sure you can still hear me periodically. Can you still hear me, Nicole? Yes, we can. Woohoo! All right. So at this point, the photo quality is probably going to decrease because these are all actually GoPro screenshots, not this one, um, from real exploration projects. 
So for me, from a young age, I always wanted to be an explorer. Um, for me, learning and experiencing new things is the whole point of being alive. And so cave diving is just another way for me to indulge these impulses. Half the reason that my business part and exploration partner, Vincent Roquette Pathala and I opened Under the Jungle was to create a base for exploration and science, not just for ourselves, but for our divers. And I think it seems to be working. You still there, Nicole? Yes, we are. So as far as exploration goes, Vince and I have explored over 90 kilometers of cave, and we've discovered around 20 new cave systems, like this one, which is a cenote called Mooch. Exploration requires a huge amount of time and money and effort, but it's incredibly rewarding. And the first thing people usually ask me is, how do you find new cenotes to explore? Some people just walk out in the jungle looking for cenotes, but unless you have the landowner's permission, this is illegal and not to mention really rude. So Vince and I have found it best and easiest and most efficient simply to talk to landowners and ask them to show us their cenotes. This is me and Vince with Jesus, who manages a cenote called Chicken Ranch for obvious reasons. And this is our team with the owner of our first exploration project, which is called Tatich. The guy's name is Antonio Manrique. Still there, Nicole? Yes, we are. Woohoo! All right. So, even when you find a person who owns a cenote and is interested in showing it to you, you still usually have a long hike in the jungle to reach the place, and you have no idea if it's going to have a cave connected to it or not. So very often we hire porters if the rock is really long and this is just a huge amount of time and effort and money. And even then, once we get to the water, I would say that maybe one out of every 20 cenotes that we check has livable cave. This place had water and it was ni a nice sinkhole, but it didn't have any horizontal cave passageways. So we found our first going cave in 2010 from the cenote that I mentioned is called Tatich. Still there, Nicole? We're here, good. All right, and then we went on to explore caves all up and down the Riviera Maya. Some were super beautiful, like this one, which we named Mukin. And then things started to get a little more interesting. We are invited to work in some towns in the center of the Yucatan Peninsula where there are sinkholes reaching over 200 feet or 60 meters in depth. And I even dove into this daunting boil on the North Coast with extreme flow conditions. But by far the strangest caves we have explored, the most dangerous and the most rewarding are the microbial caves that we've been finding near the southern border of the state. So in 2015, we took a boat to a hole in a mangrove forest, and we dropped down into this spooky green entrance. And we found ourselves in a cave filled with these weird, long, brown formations. And when I swam to a solid-looking tie-off point to tie off my line, it just dissolved in my hand. And at the same time, the ceiling sort of shifted and slid off in like a weird, vague jiggle. Still there, Nicole? We're here. Woo! When I had to recover from my surprise, I realized that absolutely everything was covered in microbial goo. We were swimming inside a vast microbial colony, and it's just the weirdest thing. I named the cave Pandora, and it's a challenging exploration. Every breath exhale causes microbial flakes to rain down on us dropping the visibility to nearly zero. What this means is that we have to be efficient when we're surveying the cave, because once you get, you get one exhalation, and then you can't see any more to write. The microbial coding itself makes installing a guideline difficult, because sometimes what looks like a solid tie off point is just a pile of guck, and the whole thing just sort of disintegrates into the water and leaves us once again without visibility. 
In small areas, if we make this mistake, we have to blindly swim forward until we clear the goo cloud and can see again. Still there, Nicole? Yep. After a while, we got used to tying off under these conditions. We sort of slice our exploration line through the microbes and we see if it hits rock. And that got okay, but what I'll never be comfortable with is the type of rock in Pandora. It has been eaten away by the acidic water. It's very heavy, it's very fragile, and it's really sharp. When placing our guideline, we have to be aware that the rock could cut our line or our hands, and we can't pull the line as tight as we might like because the rock might snap or shatter off. The large crystal formations are so fragile that Vincent saw a meters long stalactite shatter off from just my bubbles hitting it as I scooted underneath it. It fell behind me, just barely missing my fins, and chunked itself into the floor and buried itself in the soft sediment. So we have discovered that for these reasons, in Pandora, it's best to keep moving forward. Finally, there is a great deal of hydrogen sulfide in the water. And you can see the difference in the clarity of the water between this editing screenshot and this one. Still there, Nicole? Yep. Our dives are averaging about five or six hours in Pandora, and so we're exposed to hydrogen sulfide for quite some while, which is problematic as it becomes toxic with long exposures. And every time we dive in Pandora, we disturb the microbes and release more hydrogen sulfide into the water. So the concentration increases over the course of an expedition. By the third day in a row, we're usually getting headaches and we reek of sulfur and we need to take a day off. So we soon reached kilometers long penetrations from Pandora. The start of the cave is where the orange star is and the furthest tunnels where the yellow circles are. At this point, the system was around nine kilometers total. And so we started looking for another entrance into the system. And we gained access to a deserted pump station with a cenote underneath that we named Melmac. After a few days of work in Melmac, it looked like the caves might be connected, but there were still a few kilometers between them. The tunnels had similar features though, so we thought this could actually be part of one really huge cave system. Still there, Nicole? We're here. All right, so in late 2018, we connected the two systems into one large cave that is now over 16 kilometers long. And this to us suggested the presence of significant cave development in the region. So over the last few years, we have continued to work in the area and we found more caves. These are photos of the microbial growth in Dagoba which is a cave about 60 kilometers to the north. There are some similarities like the goo, and these are some sort of micro microbial growth that we've named fuzzies. But the deep saltwater tunnels in Dagoba are filled with crystalline and gray formations and weird gray clay on the floor. We also dove in a lagoon, which was really horrible. This place was called Vulcan. And it was just basically a silty green buck hole. And we found a cenote that we named Antares a bit to the north of Dagoba. Checking in with Nicole, still there? Yeah. So da uh, Antares was also filled with hydrogen sulfide and with goo and with sharp spiky formations. And about two or three years ago, we dived in a lagoon and we found two more caves. This is the entrance to one of them, which we named Juno. The caves here are difficult and they have reversing flow conditions. And we even found a wheelbarrow 500 feet back in Juno, which had been sucked in by the flow. And this is Ursus, which is the Sinete on the other side of the lagoon. It has similar reversing flow conditions that make it undiveable most of the year. And this is taken on a clear day. And finally, a little over a year ago, we found another cave west of Pandora with the most messed up and restricted wet entrance that I have ever seen. 
And this one we named Medusa. Checking in, Nicole, still there? You're there. All right, so the discovery of Medusa is the single proudest moment of my cave career because I found the cave based on a hypothesis that I came up with about cave distribution in the area. And it was so challenging that there was no way, even a year before, that I would have had the experience with microbial caves needed to make the discovery. It just happened at the right time. And in this area, we've checked hundreds of possibilities. We found really few caves, but when we found this one, we knew we were finally on to something. So together, these eight caves that we have worked in over the last eight years point to the existence of a huge and unexplored cave system in an area stretching over 150 kilometers. And I think that this will be our legacy as explorers, the discovery of a massive, dirty, disgusting, and hostile cave system where no one knew there was one before. Still there, Nicole? Yep. Okay, so the final sort of little subtopic here is science. Um, as a trained chemist, I have always been interested in the science of Mexico's flooded caves. And our shops involve all sorts of things, but I'll focus on one of the main opportunities for our former students. This is Dr. Patricia Beddoes, a renowned hydrogeologist from Northwestern University. And she's been studying caves here in the area for more than 20 years. I've been helping her install data loggers that she invented in the local caves for the last few years. And together we have worked to create Under the Jungle's annual science week, which is a nonprofit week where we pair our former students with Dr. Beddoes and other local scientists to assist in doing real cave science. This is one of my former students preparing to take water samples. In 2020, we couldn't do this with her here because she couldn't travel to her, due to her university position, but we still managed to make the annual science week work. And in general, we had a nice group of former students involved. We learned to survey key sites and assemble the data loggers and install them in the caves. And for me, being able to offer these opportunities and these sorts of experiences to my former students and give back to the community is one of the most rewarding aspects of my work. And I have a long bunch of videos and many documentaries on my website about the cave science and the science weeks that we do. So as I come to the end of my talk, I hope that I've shown you that cave diving in Mexico is more than just a bunch of crazy, risk-seeking adrenaline junkies swimming around in the dark. Our caves are astonishingly beautiful and they're filled with history and science and mysteries to be solved. Cave training itself is methodical and safe and organized. And if someday you choose to become a certified cave diver, there's a lifetime of adventures awaiting for you under the jungle. And if you want to learn more about my shop and training programs or just watch a bunch of fun cave diving videos, you can visit us at underthejungle.com. And we also are on Instagram, of course, uh, under the jungle and Facebook on under the jungle. So I hope that gives you lots of fun information and some resources to learn more about caves. And thank you for the opportunity. I can take some questions now if people have any. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks everybody for You're hanging welcome. on there to make sure we could get the rest of your presentation. Uh, I do have a few questions. Uh, this one coming in, uh, they want to know, can you explain your pre-dive procedure, any acronym that you prefer to use and why? Uh, yeah, so our pre-dive procedure is pretty detail-oriented. I am what people would refer to as anal retentive. So um, we train a really detailed, um, detailed, detailed pre-dive checks, and I'm not going to get into the full thing because it would take me about 10 minutes to get through, but we have dry checks where we make sure we have everything like on us before we get in the water. And then when we get in the water, we start with a leak and bubble check immediately to make sure that we don't have any leaks or failed gear and that we would immediately get out and fix it. We move through every single piece of gear that we have. 
then we move on to everything that has to do with numbers. So um, the gas plan, depth, time, et cetera. We do a visualization of the dive, and then we review any key hand signals that we would use during the dive. Um, and so they want to know, you were talking about some of these dives being a few hours long. So what is the longest dive you've ever been on for an exploration? Um, so far, the longest dive I've done was eight hours, more or less. And that oh was really ridiculous. That was a no deco dive um, in a shallow cave. And there were three of us. And uh, it was a swim dive. It was the dive where I... Uh, got in like a big argument with my exploration partner, Vince, because we were both very broke dive instructors at this point. And um, I told him we had to buy scooters or we were going to die. And he was like, you can't afford scooters. And I'm like, you either need to ask your parents for money or I am going to call your mother and tell her that your son is going to die if she does not loan him money for his scooter. And so we borrowed a bunch of money and got scooters so we didn't have to do eight hour swim dives because that was frankly really dangerous. It wasn't a good idea. <laughs> that was on open circuit. It was a lot of tanks. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, it was well, you actually have um, some of your former students listening in on tonight's talk, and they're talking about how fantastic you are as an instructor, and that uh, with your pre-dive checklist, um, she says that, that she does it every dive that she does. So um, how do you help people with their nerves about doing a dive in a cave? Um, I would say that, like, really, if you're getting to the point that you're doing cave training, you may be excited or exhilarated, but if you're actually scared or super nervous, you're not doing it yet. Um, you shouldn't be scared in a cave. That wouldn't, I wouldn't take somebody who's like actually scared um, on a cave dive, even in a training scenario. Um, it is progressive. So I think probably the answer you're looking for is that you build up to it to the point where the diver themselves is confident that they can do the thing and that they can solve any problems they need to and get them out safely, even without my help. I'm an instructor, but you don't know what's gonna happen to me. I could have a heart attack in the cave and you would need to know that you can get yourself out, even though it's a training dive. So I make sure that my students have that level of confidence before I take them into any sort of diving scenario that I might put them in. Awesome. Is there anything uh, that we can do to train for cave diving? Like, you know, is there dry runs that you can do um, to help you run like lines into things? Uh, um, not, you kind of need to have an instructor help you with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. What I would say that is really beneficial is base skills. Um, the hardest thing for people to do do here for the type of dives that we do because it's different in Florida is be absolutely still um you can't work you can't run a line or take notes or put a marker on the line or do any of this stuff if you're not absolutely stable in the water um, if you're worried about your buoyancy or you're doing tiny fin kicks then it doesn't work and 50 percent of your brain is occupied by staying stable so for me, the best thing a student can do before they come into any training with me isn't even trying the gear. If they haven't used doubles before, I wouldn't want them to before I work with them. Get in a pool, get in three feet of water, and hover, and try to stop all movement. It is the hardest thing you can do in diving, but it will give you a stable platform to work from, and it will improve all of your diving. Fantastic. All right. So they want to know, how do you choose the name of your new cave systems? Um, a lot of the time, some of the caves have pre-existing names. If it's on somebody's land, they often have Maya names or something that they've already named them. So if they do, we would respect that name. A lot of the places, you know, um, yeah, they'll have like old school names. Um, but some of these places, the southern microbial caves, they're not on anybody's lands. I mean, these are you hit off a boat or things like that. So um, the very first one of those that we dived in was Pandora. And I had just seen the movie Avatar, which 
as a diver, if you're a diver and you watch Avatar, this is a different game probably than a normal person because you realize that this magical planet that James Cameron created has like Christmas tree worms on land and all of these things and it's really cool. Um, there's all sorts of underwater creatures that they took inspiration from. And so we went into this cave and it was filled with really strange like microbial life that I didn't, we didn't know if it was toxic. We didn't know if we were gonna have like skin infections or like flesh eating bacteria when we got out. We had no idea what was going on. Uh, we'd never seen anything like this. And so I named it Pandora, not after the mythological feature, feature but um, after the planet in the movie Avatar, a planet filled with strange and unusual life. And so all the southern caves started to get um, like planet names. So Dagobah is the home planet of Yoda and Molomac is the home planet of Alf. And Juno is like a system. Um, Antares is, I believe it's a constellation, Vince saves that one. And so on and so forth. We have Ursus uh, and places like this. So we're naming that. And then Medusa, I know it isn't a planet, but it was this crazy wild cave. And so I named that one Medusa to go with the Pandora thing. Well, I just want to uh, remind people during this presentation, all those beautiful cave photos, those are all Natalie's and some of her colleagues, right? Those are- uh, There's like two photos in there that aren't mine, yeah. And so uh, those are all fantastic, beautiful photography. Um, any chance you're gonna make a, a coffee table book for uh, us cave explorers? <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm ready to make a book. It's um, on the list of things I'd like to do one day. I still feel like I'm learning photography, believe it or not. But I have been doing limited runs of prints. So um, I did a limited run of prints about four months ago, um, and most of them sold out. So I'll do a limited run of new prints and new, new images. Sometime, I imagine, in the upcoming couple months. I'll announce it on my Facebook for Under the Jungle, on my personal Facebook, and I'll also announce it on Instagram. And then I just keep doing it until they're sold out, and then I stop for a while. I have a really cool photo printer here, so I actually print them all myself and ship them from Mexico. So you get oh, wow. like a signed limited edition print. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, well, while you were um, not on the camera, I actually <laughs> filled the spot with the raffle. So when so somebody already ran, you know, got their fifty dollar gift card, and they were excited. Oh, so cool. <laughs> well, who was it? Um, it was Robert. Um, I can't pronounce his last name. I'm so sorry, but it's like, uh, <laughs> you're going to kill me. Kakamameric? Kakamameric? Uh, sorry. Sorry, Robert. Anyways, um, if you guys have- Robert with the difficult to pronounce for Gringa's last name. <laughs> Um, so guys, if you have more questions for Natalie, uh, you know how to get a hold of her. Just go to Facebook or Instagram, go to Under the Jungle, um, that's the handle, and make sure you can uh, keep in touch with her. And if you'd like to do some cave um, exploration, get some training, you can go to her as well. And uh, if you want to get any of those photos when they get released, make sure you're following her um, her Instagram and her Facebook so that you know what's happening with Natalie. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm sorry about the, uh, the slight delay, but we got through it and Natalie, fantastic mm -hmm. photos, great information. I think we all want to go you. cave diving now. So, uh, guys, yeah, let's grab our amazing. gear. Yeah. Let's grab cool. our gear and go diving. See everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs>